Hello everyone, and we should be online. Uh, with me today is uh, Dr. Noel Butijic from the uh, University of Malta, who will talk to us about food history and uh, food culture history. So, uh, hi to everybody in the chat. Hi, Charlene. Uh, so, Doctor, would you like to uh, introduce yourself before we uh, start uh, getting into the subject? Okay, so... Um... As Carl said, I'm Noel. Uh, by training, I am a historian, but also my my other love is anthropology. And so, what I do in my research is pretty much put, put the two of them together. Um, of course, my particular interest is food and the way of how people speak through food. Um, uh, that being said, um, I have been uh, working on. Primarily, my first project was bread, and I was looking at bread as a means of uh, how women uh, ex express themselves uh, through bread as a force of power, identity, and authority in the 18th century. Um, however, since 1998, I have been doing research about uh, food in general, published uh, four books, um, several papers. And so uh, that being said, um, I have been very much intrigued in that. The, uh, the second thing I would I would probably mention that might interest a couple of you people is that uh, since 2014 I have introduced food in museums, um, particularly here in Malta. Um, of course, these are the same places which they often tell us that no food and drink and talk is allowed. <laughs> so I I decided. Well, I started in 2010, but eventually I defied all of this um, after four years of hard work in trying to convince the local national agency that goes by the name of Heritage Malta to actually start to have activities related to food. The main purpose is among other things to uh, bring artifacts, but also knowledge related to food to a table within the museum itself, because food is a fantastic talker. Food is a force of conviviality. And so um, it's great that people can actually experience the museum from a totally different light. Um, we haven't stopped since then. And uh, now I am the director of a company which we've set within Heritage Malta, which is known as Taste History. And uh, among other things, what we do is we try to rediscover and reinvent um, past recipes uh, and, and give them and, and, and give them you know, a life, breed life back into them and, and share them with our patrons who actually come on in and um, uh, taste, but also exchange knowledge with 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 our museum patrons, uh, with our museum curators, and, and from that point, um, I think we've, it's been a fantastic recipe, uh, if you allow me, you know, pun intended. Uh, and yeah, we're, we're, we 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 have a blast at at doing it. So yeah, we really enjoy it. Okay, uh, hi, Cross, Lisa, and uh, Sean. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so, just wanted to ask you, uh, just to uh, get things rolling, if someone from, I don't know, any point in the past had to uh, jump forward in time to the present day, what would they find most unusual about our food? Many things. Um, let, me, let, me, let me clarify a couple of things. To, to start with, um, culinary culture as part of culture. Culture is alive, but, you know, culture breeds, culture changes through time. Uh, so, technically speaking, um, there will be, what happens is, Carl, is that, that people would recognize a lot of things, but probably they will take a while before they start to enjoy the tastes. Um, reason being is that uh, taste is something that is acquired. So 
Um, like I can wean you off if you, if you have sugar in your coffee or your tea, I can wean you off that. Uh, in two three weeks, I I will train your brain to think there's sugar in it, or else I will train your brain to think that this is okay. So you know, taste is something which is acquired. So since ch since 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 childhood, we are we are trained to uh, taste food in a particular way. So the first thing that they would definitely have problems with is is dealing with uh, aspects of taste. Um, but then what's really interesting is that depending how far back we want to go, we would notice that uh, there are a number of products which would today take relatively quite 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 obvious that they've existed forever. But in reality, um, in many cases, these products were introduced and in some cases they were used and adapted to the needs of the, the people who have inherited, um, copied, uh, or applied those same products within their own culture. So, just to give you just to give you a couple of of, of examples, let me start off with three very important drinks: um, coffee, tea, and chocolate. Uh, yes, chocolate is a drink. Okay. Um, so here we have in the actually in the 16th century. Uh, there was no notion of drinking coffee or drinking tea or drinking chocolate in Europe. Coffee was primarily an African drink, which was uh, copied by the Ottoman forces in the Middle East. Um, in fact, uh, very, very, very recently, I have found from a Turkish archive uh, sold as a, a particular um, Ottoman, actually to be precise, a Janizari uh, soldier who was buying coffee on his way to Malta just before the 1565 siege. Okay, um, so so yes, uh, I used to joke around with this. I used to say there might have been a possibility that there were coffee pots that were left behind when in September, in 7th September, uh, 1565, just before the Santa Maria Festa here in Malta, the, you know, the, there might have been uh, Ottoman forces who on the run in fear that uh, the, the, the great support, the Grande Soccorso uh, that was meant to arrive from Sicily actually landed in Malta and out of the chaos, they packed their necessities and ran to their ships in, 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 in Marsam Shet Harbor. But what's really interesting is I used to joke around with this and I used to say, God knows how many Maltese have actually, you know, stepped on and broke these, these coffee pods that were left behind, these Turkish coffee pods, probably made out of copper, right? Um, I, well, now I have actually found, uh, found a reference of uh, coffee that potentially was actually drunk in Malta at a time when uh, very little as yet was known about about coffee in Malta. It was the earliest reference to coffee, at least in Malta, is 1631. And, and, and for the international audience here, just to put you into the picture, uh, this is one of the earliest references of the consumption of coffee that we find in Europe. Uh, apart from Venice, uh, the first references to coffee shops uh, in Europe is, is, is actually dated to, to Malta. I'm not saying that the Maltese were the first to actually come across the drink. I'm not saying that because in the late 16th century, um, there we already have uh, references um, of even British travelers who were in, 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 in Constantinople and who came across the drink and they described it as dark and bitter uh, and Many of them, because of the acquired taste that we've talked about, uh, tasted it, but did not. They moved away from it, and when they wrote about coffee, they said that they, it it doesn't taste good. Apart from the fact that in this case, this is the drink of the enemy, right? So especially in the case of in the case of Malta, you have you know you, you don't say hey I'm no Bodhijan I'm Maltese. The first thing you'd say is I'm no Bodhijan I'm Christian. Uh, so so you know the the first force of identification. Is without doubt the the, the, the religious uh, allegiance that one would would follow. So uh, coffee, of course, uh, very very interesting. Um, 
the second drink, which in the case of Malta, it doesn't really take off, but it takes off in uh, other places such as Holland and Belgium, um, and also England, uh, is actually tea. Uh, tea coming from Asia. So coffee is coming from Africa with influences in the Middle East, very strong influences in the Middle East. Uh, tea that's coming from Asia. Um, we do have references to the availability of tea in Malta, but the quantities are very little. Um, however, we have references coming from uh, mainly Holland, um, and, and the quantities are, are it's, it was definitely a popular drink there. Uh, and, and then of course, uh, apart, from, apart from tea, uh, another very exclusive and very expensive drink uh, was actually chocolate um, coming from Central America. And, and since, I've mentioned, since I've mentioned Central America uh, and, and precisely to, to, to locate your question, Carl, um, uh, the discoveries of the Americas by Columbus in 1592 would usher a fantastic period of discovery. In this case, not discoveries of uh, people and distant lands, but actually the discovery of new products and new tastes, which uh, you know the exoticness behind them would would influence many generations and eventually also many chefs. Uh, I'm referring to you know, very basic products like pepper, uh, green pepper, uh, red peppers. Um, you have uh, aubergines, you have uh, potatoes, um, sweet potatoes, uh, you have corn. Um, so there's a, there's a whole list of, of products, which I mean, turkey, the turkey, was was also uh, imported from these distant lands. Uh, uh, correct, me if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it's a uh, kind of a very rare situation in history where you have we suddenly have these new uh, let's call them raw materials uh, suddenly appearing, right? Oh yes, I mean uh, uh, it would be silly to think that they all came in one full swing. That was not the case. Um, so so you have the 16th century that slowly but surely is constantly being peppered by these new exotic tastes. Um, pineapple, for instance, um, very, very expensive. Uh, the pineapple uh, itself, well, the nice thing about the pineapple was that you could actually um, uh, transport it over long distances without, without the, 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 the fruit getting, getting bad. So uh, un unlike other products, um, such as bananas, for instance, it took a while to figure out how uh, a one month journey would be good enough to to actually transpose the transfer the the fruit from from Central America to to Europe. So you know there were situations where by the time they're halfway through the the voyage, they would either eat it or else they toss it overboard because the bananas go go bad. Um, however. Uh, th these are the these were the distant lands that people would not travel to. Um, these were the distant lands where normally what happens is people will get in touch with maybe the peripheral coastal areas, which uh, at the end of the day would also inspire the element of exoticness that uh, these places had. So uh, these the, you know these places became fantastic storytellers. But more importantly, these were the souvenirs of these distant of these distant lands. So if you did not, of course, we're talking about a period in time here, we're getting on a boat, getting on a ship and sailing to open sea, like the Atlantic uh, was a little bit of, uh, how can I put this? If I have to put it in, in a context today, I would say this is pretty much like the daredevil acts that, um, I don't know, a Red Bull uh, <laughs> adrenaline pushers actually go to. I mean, recently, right, two planes dive, the pilots get out of them and they switch the planes in midair. I mean, that is, to me, <laughs> sensical. I mean, that, yeah, um, the best thing I've ever orbited is a buffet table. So, um, so, so when you think a little bit about it, um, these were the people, I mean, a, a, a vessel, a 16th century vessel was pretty much like a toothpick in the middle of and the And it, it is pretty much an epic adventure. It's, uh, you're going half oh, the way around the world anyway. 
exactly. So you can imagine why uh, Treasure Island. You can imagine why uh, uh, Gulliver's Travels. You can imagine why um, I don't know. Uh, so Robinson Crusoe and 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 the whole yeah. Um, so, so the exoticness, I mean, people could read about them without actually having to travel there. But what's really cool is that there was an added element to it. Um, of course, there was, a, there was, you know, for those that could read, you could actually read uh, these kind of books, right? Um, for those who were, who, you know, who had the artistic talent, they actually sketched out some of the experiences that they, that they witnessed there and, um, I, I would say that the, that the famous Belgian school of tapestry has made it possible for many parts of Europe to witness for the first time images of what the American Indians look, looked like, the, the Indios, right? Um, we, we have images of, of animals and, and birds um, and fish that uh, were totally alien to to the Europeans, I mean, the Turkey, for instance, is one of them, right? Um, so, and, and that's why it, 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 was, it was referred to as Polodindia, uh, India, not, not as India as we know it, the, the geographical name, but the Indios, uh, the Indians of, of Central America. So, as so, in so West we, Indies kind of thing? West Indies, among yeah. other things, yes. Yeah, so, um, so, so what, what you have here is this manifestation of, of, of the visual arts, I mean, uh, the, the, I mean, in the case of Malta, a beautiful set of tapestries highlight the African experiences and the, um, the Central American and, and Caribbean experiences. And these beautiful images are, to, they still exist to this day um, in the Grand Master's Palace in Valletta. But then what's really important to us is actually also the consumption of the product and, and, and the science behind it. There was a total obsession of trying to find ways of how to bring the seeds and the plants. And in some cases, you, know, you have botanists, trained botanists that were, that were transferred to, to, to these distant lands to actually uh, learn how to cultivate, how to grow these particular products. And, and so instead of waiting, instead of waiting for them to be imported from somewhere else, uh, the idea was to have Central America and to have uh, several parts of Africa uh, and several parts of Asia instituted right at the very heart of what was considered to be the center of the world. Um, so, so Europa it, it itself, right? Um, so, so technically speaking, um, if, if someone, if, if today we had to, if we had, we had, if we had to time travel uh, back into the uh, late medieval period, but especially the 16th and the 17th century, we will notice that, that there's, there, there's, there's this massive impetus that influences the kitchen primarily of, of the nobility. So we, we, have, we have a very small section of uh, the aristocracy in, in Europe who is uh, doubling into these new tastes. And we, we start having all these wonderful, all these wonderful uh, representations both on the table. So they, these become uh, a marker of material culture, right? So, um, you know, having, Having a, 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 a coffee, a, having a chocolate pot in your house is in itself already a statement of your economic and social background. Um, and, and then, of course, having chocolate to, to spare, to, to, to turn into a drink, but also having the knowledge of how to prepare it was, was, was of particular importance. At, at the same time, we see the, for the first time the, the development of aristocratic kitchens and the hiring of, I always start to see the, the slow uh, switch from uh, women working in the kitchen to men working in the kitchen. And so, so th there's this, this very interesting transition that, that happens. How did that come about? Of or, or rather, why did that uh, come about? Well, of course, because among other things, uh, we have uh, you know, this, this manifestation now with food and how food would be shared uh, among larger quantities of people. So, so the, the whole element of convivality, of sophisticated convivality, uh, becomes part of this process of civilization, of uh, civilization at the table, where 
even new rules were being written. You, you have, among other things, so, so you have issues like, for instance, you no longer uh, wipe your mouth in the tablecloth, but now you start to get a napkin. Uh, there is this new level of hygiene that starts to come on in. Hygiene, not in our sense, but you know, the, 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 I mean, you still wash yourself maybe, I don't know, once a month, okay? Um, so yeah, for those who are following, uh, it's not necessarily something very sophisticated by our standards. But back then, uh, holding a handkerchief in your, in your hand, or else presenting your 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 guests with napkins, um, was considered to be uh, at the, you know an an exhibition of your level of hygiene. So you know keeping your nose clean becomes something very important. So you no longer wipe your nose using your sleeve uh, or your fingers to do so. Right, um, uh, spitting at the table becomes you know this is part of the civilizing. Uh, the civilizing culture uh, uh, around the table. Um, but I think more important, well, of course, you have the introduction of uh, uh, plates, um, but more importantly, uh, there's another tool that is added on the table. Um, so normally on aristocratic tables, you would get knives and spoons, but you don't get forks. So uh, again, in the 16th, but primarily the 17th century, you see also the introduction of the fork. And with the introduction of the fork, um, we start to see these new uh, practices that start to manifest themselves among the educated. Educated, not necessarily because you go to school. Educated in the sense of learning the, the notions of how would one behave at the table. So for the first time, um, it, it becomes uh, pretty much established, although it takes over, over a century to be established. But what happens is that once that you sit in a, at an aristocratic table, the, 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 you know, your space, it's, it becomes like you have like an imaginary tube around you and no one is allowed to breach into that tube. Um, so the fork, the plate, of course, the, the rest of the cutlery, uh, that becomes uh, your your sacred space, and no one was allowed to breach into it. While just before that, you know, people could would would cross through you, and they will um, they will serve themselves from a common plate. Um, so there's a central plate, and everyone will just grab with their hands, and they stick their hands in their mouth, and yeah. So yeah, practices that today we consider to be um, we don't you know we, we don't necessarily do that. Um, but then we also see the development of, again, in aristocratic kitchens, uh, how one would would serve. So, so, so we go from uh, alarus, what was known as alarus. Um, so, in in medieval times, uh, if if you prepared a pheasant, for instance, what you do is your chef would prepare the pheasant in the in the in the kitchen, of course. But then the pheasant is again decorated entirely with its uh, feathers again, and it will be taken on the table. So, uh, so yeah, th that was normal practice, right? Eventually, what happens is that uh, we move from that into you prepare the animal or the um, the vegetables, what you have. But normally, the issue, the issue is with butchering, right? So it's whether it's a bird or 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 an animal. Um, what happens is that if you're if you're roasting ducks, you, you just you just take the whole duck out and, and that's it full stop. You don't dress it up again with 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 flowers. However, the butchering happens at at the at the table. With alarus, what happens is that uh, the 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 butchering would still um, happen at, at the table, but normally there will be like a side table and that is where the cuts uh, happen. Um, and then the cuts are put on the table and people just help themselves from a common trencher. Uh, but with a la Francais, what happens is a la Francais is very similar to what we have today. So basically what happens is as part of this uh, civilizing process, um, what happens is that the entire butchering process uh, happens in the kitchen and the, the food is presented to you already plated. 
so, so you don't have to mix with other people to uh... exactly so so there is this gradual but very interesting uh development that that starts to that starts to uh, happen um in in a way of 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 educating people however however here we're talking about maybe 10% of an entire population possibly even less than that so so this process took took hundreds of years and and to this day we still know that we still have some individuals that we just you know you still need to you still need to turn them into ladies and gentlemen because the way of how they consume their food and the way of how they behave at the table is not necessarily what the rest of the world is doing um however um you know th that being said the civilizing process took took forever especially since all the way until the 19th century large parts of the populations in europe didn't even own a fork and many of them never used a fork right so the assumption that because we have references and documentation of people owning a particular cutlery then everyone was actually using that which is which of course is not the case you know the, the pocket knife i mean today if you're caught carrying a pointed object you're arrested right um back then it was the norm that for men to actually carry um a, a pocket knife and, you know you clean under your 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 nails you butcher your animals um and you cut and you cut your bread with it so uh, technically speaking uh, we're talking about a very different society which Absolutely. had very different interests in uh what to consume and 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 how to consume it um so uh yeah that is you know, you know some other things that maybe i could talk about is uh, are related to what we today refer to as offal food um basically these were you know um today we 40% of the animals that we butcher they actually go in, in uh, into into our waste okay um 40% so 40% 40% of the animal goes into waste okay That's massive uh, yeah, yeah um so so today we're we're trying to uh rekick um although this varies between uh, countries in 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 the world what is known as nose to tail um so this is a this is the this is the new movement which of course the i think the most famous of them all is farm to fork everyone knows what farm to fork is and in the case of uh, uh, uh meat consumption we today talk about um uh, nose to tail uh, the, the reason why is because as as time went by and as as food become became uh, more democratized in the world uh, what happened is that as a result of uh, choice uh, we preferred uh, to uh, literally to um, start to pick and choose what to consume so uh, i don't know the inners for instance they all go to waste um, although in the in the 13th century 14th century all the way to the 19th century um, for instance tripe was commonly consumed by by everyone um, the chef of of the pope um, you know the famous book by bartolomeo scappi uh, also has several recipes of how to prepare tripe right um, blood pudding is 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 is, is another one that uh, has has gone to waste in, in in many countries. I mean, in the case of Malta, I think we've lost it for an entire generation. And only very recently, some two, three months ago, um, the local uh, abattoir, the local national abattoir has started to uh, reproduce um, blood pudding. But we also have this aversion, this aversion of eating um, uh, pig ears, for instance, or ox tail, or cow's tongue, um, or uh, brain fritters. Um, so the question of taste, like I mentioned earlier, is it like we uh, we never acquired the taste for that, or how, how did it happen? Yes. So we speak, I mean, Carl, we speak through food, okay? I mean, you're drinking a 250 euro bottle of wine, I'm drinking a 5 euro bottle of wine. We don't really have to say much, right? We know who's who's got a sound economic base. Right, um, so we we speak through food, right? Uh, if you have, and normally what happens is that normally it is it is the aristocratic classes 
the aristocratic class, members of the aristocratic class that set the standards. And then of course, the lower classes are constantly willing to emulate that. I mean, look at, look at spices, for instance, in the medieval period. I mean, the, you know, the, when you think about spices and the difficulties of importing particular spices from the Middle East or from, from uh, Asia, uh, it, uh, spices were extremely expensive. Uh, however, as, as, uh, you know, as soon as transport improved and connectivity, not only, not only through, through maritime connections, but also through, through uh, uh, overland connections, as soon as we start to see that uh, the spices start to become more common uh, in, in Europe, then the price of the product would also start to, to drop. And as a result of that, as a, as a process of democratization of, of, of food, then you start to have more and more people who are who are uh, have the you know enough resources to actually purchase uh, that product. I mean, this is the same thing goes with meat. Um, large sections of European society did not consume meat on a regular basis. We might think that they were consuming meat on a regular basis, but that is not the case. Meat was was primarily the uh, consumed by the aristocratic classes. Just to put you into the picture here. Uh, allow me to use malt again as a as a point of reference. Uh, like in 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 Gozo, they would they would butcher uh, a, a cow once every month, uh, just to give you an idea of how low the consumption of meat was um, among the common people. And probably most of that meat ended up coming to Malta after all. Um, because there, there, there weren't enough people that could afford to buy uh, meat. So, so here we're talking about a society, uh, especially in Europe in general, where I would say 95% uh, of the population is primarily consuming, they, they are, they are, you know, their energy is derived primarily from grain. So, so you know, 80% of the diet is primarily dictated by bread and large, large consumption of bread. And then what in Latin they used to refer to as companaticum, uh, which means anything that is served with bread. So if there's if there's a piece of ham, probably you know that is that is not always the case because that's again another meat product, but a lot of cheeses, onions, um, you know, uh, olives, capers, right? Uh, and, and, and of course, savored in different ways, because you can always have, you know, um, uh, fresh onions, but at the same time, you can also have pickled onions. Uh, so, so there was the same thing with olives. I mean, you can have fresh olives, but you can also have olives that are in brine, for instance. Uh, so there's the element of preservation um, in a time when there is, there is no refrigeration. So your ability of uh, having this this interplay of eating products that are fresh, but also products that need to be preserved over uh, a, over a long period of time. Let me just give you an idea. For instance, uh, I don't know broad beans. For instance, you would you would eat broad beans fresh. Uh, I don't know March, April, maybe maybe into May, right? But then what happens is any any leftover uh, broad beans are actually dried up and uh, they are dried up so that people can consume them over uh, a period of months and produce sev several things with, with broad beans. So in, in Europe, especially the Mediterranean region, um, there's a broad bean dip and in Maltese is known as begilla, um, which is a, a very common, it, what was a very common fare uh, in, uh, all the way up to the all the way up to the early years of the 20th century and this was pretty much like mcdonald's today it was like fast food you just get out on the street and you'd find someone that would sell um begilla unless you had the time and the will to to to, to work at home but 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 there again i mean you, you have you have this notion of of change that is manifesting itself i will say something about ice in a minute but since i'm mentioning all of this if someone had to travel back in time, you would notice a couple of things, uh, especially in the houses of the common people, there is no kitchen. Right. Uh, the kitchen was a makeshift space. Um, 
unless you had, in fact, if you were to compare people living in urban spaces with people living in rural spaces, the chances are that you are more likely to find a dedicated space for a stove in rural areas rather than in urban areas, especially uh, the urban populace, the urban common people in the cities. Uh, normally what they had was um, mobile stoves, okay? Um, what in technically they're known as countryside stoves. And uh, basically it, it, it would be either made out of stone or out of clay. And especially the clay ones, they're very mobile. You take them out in the central courtyard or out in the, on the, you know, on the roof or of your house if you have one or your balcony if you have one or else just outside the doorstep. And that's where you cook because uh, there's, of course, a strong element of smoke coming out. But then the embers you'd also use as, especially in warm places, I'm sorry, in cold places, you would also use the stove and the embers in it as a heater during night. Um, but what, what's also really interesting is that the sophisticated, the aristocratic kitchens were fully equipped with endless amounts of pots and pens and, 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 and um, spits and like if, if I were to take the the uh, kitchen of the Inquisitor's Palace uh, here in Malta, mm -hmm. uh, this gentleman also had an automated spit. Can you imagine that you're roasting something using using a, a grandfather clock um, machine equipment? So you you would wind it up, and instead of having someone uh, for two hours. Uh, rotating the animal around, you know, on a spit to get it roasted. Uh, basically, what happens is that that you 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 would you you you'd have this mechanized way of how to do it. So uh, the other thing, which is really really important for us, and sometimes we don't really make the difference, is you know the common people would have um, kitchen tools that are made out of terracotta of clay, but sophisticated kitchens had their tools made out of copper. Or, or metal. Um, so okay. the durability, uh, but not just the durability, but also the effectiveness of how to, to uh, heat and cook uh, food had a total different effect. I mean, we all know that metals are very good conductors of heat, uh, maybe less so uh, terracotta, clay, right? Um, but but having, having these elements uh, at hand was in, in itself a statement of uh, sophistication. Uh, so again, if you had to travel back in time, you would you would notice that then and that there's uh, these kind of differences. The the other thing is, while there might not necessarily have been kitchens in the homes of several people, so the kitchen was pretty much a makeshift thing, right? The table would be so there is no concept of table in many spaces, especially among the poor. Uh, the table is pretty much uh, two trestles and uh, two pieces of wood, and that's how you lay your, your table. Why? Because if you're living in a, in a one-room, two-room space, normally also the, the place where you're eating and sleeping is actually translated into a workshop during the day, because that's from where you, you do your work, right? Um, so, so, you know, the, the whole idea of having dedicated spaces for the preparation of food among the lower classes uh, would be a total exaggeration. So if you were to travel back, back in time, you would notice that in some cases, people didn't even have a kitchen. They just had a makeshift space. So it's kind of the uh, dedication of different rooms to different tasks in the house is also something that's coming down from the aristocratic uh, pattern. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's precisely that. Okay. Um, of course, the... It's slightly different in, in the countryside. Uh, however, it would be silly on our part to think that just because they might have had the space, most of the space was dedicated to look after the animals. So, so in most cases, the farm, you would store your tools, you would keep your, your animals in, so you, you turn your, your spaces into stables, right? Um, so, uh, but, but then, uh, since I've mentioned the Inquisitor's Palace, um, but this, you'd find this in, I don't know, the other important palaces in, in I've seen them in Spain, I've seen them in England, I've seen them in Italy, um, where you would have the, you know, the kitchen was not one room, but it was a complex of rooms. And normally four or five rooms, uh, all dedicated for different functions, for storage spaces, what the Italians would refer to as tinello, 
uh, the Tinello was pretty much a, a, a room or more than one rooms that were normally adjoined to each other. So you can actually walk from one room to the other. And basically this was an entire kitchen complex where you would store things like, the, for instance, they knew there were specific ways of how to store meat, of how to hang meat. Um, so for instance, birds had to be hanged with, from the head. Um, and if you, were, if you had to see paintings, you would notice, especially the Dutch, I, on, on my head, I'm thinking of Jan Stan right now. But if you were to see uh, paintings coming from medieval and early modern periods, you would notice that there is a technique of how one would, would, would set up um, would, would set up the, the, the meat room, right? Um, and, and, and in some cases, you, you didn't just have a meat room, but uh, in, in some cases, in some uh, uh, aristocratic kitchens, you also had a space where to uh, uh, store items that required an element of cooling down, of, of an, an impossibility, also the possibility of freezing. Um, so, so like in, again, if if I were to, um, I'm I'm thinking of of Palazzo Chigi in Italy right now. Um, uh, I'm thinking of the Palazzo Ducale in Turin. Uh, you know, these spaces had the necessary equipment. In other words, boxes lined with tin on the inside where they would put ice in. In them, so you have massive ice boxes. These were like chest freezers. Our idea of chest freezers, where you know you would buy the ice, and then uh, you would store your your different products, particularly products that uh, have um, that can go that they can go bad in a very short time, um, and and store and store those products in there. I mean, in, in the case of Malta, we also have the Inquisitor's Palace and the Grandmaster's Palace, both of which have among their lists of items. Um, in the inventories include also um, ice boxes. So here again, it's total sophistication. Uh, so again, if, if one had to travel back, you, you would see this. But for those countries that could uh, also use ice or had 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 the possibility of 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 buying ice, I know that some you know some some of our followers here are thinking. You know, Malta. You know, ice and Malta don't really go together. But you have you have a, a massive industry of um, actual contractors whose job was specifically to import ice from from Sicily, actually from Mount Etna. Um, and again, ice uh, relatively quite expensive. But what's really interesting about it is that, well, to start with, ice was found in Malta all year round. The role of ice primarily was, especially in winter time, it was primarily to to be used instead of anesthetic. So, um, you know, here here we had we had of course one of the leading um, uh, medical institutions in Europe. We have to keep in mind that when we're talking about Malta, uh, we have not only um, several Maltese doctors that would that would travel. Out, you know, outside of the island to, to to train in some of the leading hospitals in um, in in Europe, mainly Italy, Italy and France. But also, you have a lot of foreigners who come and train here. There was a one of the best medical schools in Europe in the 16th and 17th, 18th century, was actually found here in Malta. Um, but the most important thing is that in the case of ice, I mean, if, if you have I don't know a ligament problem in your arm. I mean, they would they would lay your your hand in, in, you know on ice uh, until they will numb it out to a point that you could actually see the operation happening. So they would open up open up your hand or your arm, and they would operate with their tools while you are watching the operation happening. But you're not feeling anything because uh, your hand is just totally numbed by 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 the by the cold temperatures of the ice. But more importantly. Um, Ice, of course, we're taking iced water, especially in, in, in hot spaces, right? Malta being one of them. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you have the uh, introduction of ice cream. Um, and, and basically what we're talking about here is, again, science and how, you know, th these great people, I mean, Leonardo, uh, you know, these, uh, Kepler, um, Copernicus, right? These great minds were, were, were running tests I mean, we think that science is something very recent, 
or <laughs> it's not the case. Um, so, so, so these people, I mean, Galileo, these people were, were great minds and among other things, they, uh, they, they also figured out that if you, if you uh, have the right uh, ratio of uh, uh, salt to ice, what happens is if you were to look at ice, ice normally carries the temperature of our fridge, right? So it's, it's maybe five, eight degrees Celsius, right? But if you add, add the right amount of ice to it, you will drop the temperature to minus, minus 10, minus 15 degrees Celsius, which is pretty much the temperature of the temperature of our freezer, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so in, in, in that case, what happens is that, that there's this process by which uh, if you know how to prepare ice, I'm, I'm sorry, how to prepare ice cream, if you knew the recipe to it, then you could also prepare uh, ice creams. And, and, and in, in Malta, we have, we have one very interesting uh, manuscript that goes back to 1748, which is, it's called Libro dei Secreti per fare dolci. It's a secret book. It's the book of secrets of how to prepare sweets, okay? Um, secret because chefs were very proud of what they do because among other things, the kitchen was a process of experimentation. So these guys would, would actually spend endless amount of hours uh, experimenting with these new products that were coming in from different parts of the world um, and introducing them and mixing them up with uh, other products that the Europeans were already accustomed to. So coffee and chocolate become part of ice creams, for instance, uh, vanilla uh, is introduced into into ice cream. So you know, chocolate ice cream and vanilla ice cream is not something that happened. 50 years ago, 80 years ago, but uh, we have already references to them um, that uh, date back to the 17th century. Um, so the element of sophistication was, was, was out there. The other sophisticated product was sugar. Um, and, and its element was twofold. Um, well, to start with, uh, sugar was, a, was, was, was considered to be a medicine, okay? Um, Ooh, so- really? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, a spoonful of sugar to help the medicine go down <laughs> um, has a very long-standing history. Sugar, of course, has. Let me put it this way: people did not just eat, particularly these new products, but there are entire scientific studies about the impact of these products on the body. So, just to give you an idea. Um, I've mentioned coffee earlier on. I know I'm, I'm just going at, I'm firing like, you know, all over the place. Um, but one of the earliest treatises written about coffee is actually also found here in Malta. Um, one of the earliest okay. recipes about coffee is actually found here in Malta. Um, and, and, and basically what's really interesting about it is that uh, the, the, the scientific treatise is written by a priest who was sent on a mission to convert Muslims into Christianity at Monte Libano, which is Lebanon today, right? And, and on his travels there, he came across this dark drink and apparently he fell in love with it um, and he consumed it. He learned how it gets to be used. He goes into so many details about how this is prepared, but also uh, the meanings of it for the people that actually consume it. But what's really interesting is that there is a cardinal whom Pope Alexander VII would appoint as the, as the person to study the effects of chocolate uh, on, on humans um, and whether chocolate could be considered as uh, something that the Christian world could uh, adopt or not it's because so is it like a moral study or an ethical study or an actual well, scientific I'm, I'm, study like th is it good bad for people yeah yeah it's a little bit of everything i mean right. and, and uh, domenico magri the author of this treatise uh, he advises it for um coffee makes you feel younger because of course it, it you know so he says for the old monk who is you know now tired and and yeah feels that he's useless and he cannot be productive anymore you know, a, a, a glass of coffee, a cup of coffee could could actually 
um, incite him again. It has this effect on the brain. They're already talking about uh, it's good for students. It's good to thin blood. It's good for women going through the menstrual period. It's, you know, they make all, now, whether some of these things still hold today or not, that's a totally different argument. Uh, of course, uh, we've learned so much about these products today. Um, but, but, but that being said, I mean, this is, this is a, this is a period in time when there was also a lot of interest in what to consume and how to consume it. So uh, it, it would be silly on our part to, to think that these people were not interested in the food that they were eating, that they were not like, you know, one famous um, author, uh, Michael Pollan, talks about the omnivore's dilemma. You know, this, this, we eat everything, okay? We, we, try, we, you know, as much as possible, we try everything. We, we consume everything, right? Um, and, and of course, this is mainly part of the problem that we have today. But, but this was not something that came about today. It has been, has been part of our system for a very long time. We want to experience new foods. We want to experience new tastes. And uh, I, I, believe if, I believe if one had to uh, travel back to the 16th century, ideally, I mean, that was the time to be because you have all of these products that are coming in and there's this whole drive this manifestation of wanting to explore what's different. And, but, but then also you have the element of creativity that I think, I think by the, land, by the end of the 17th century and, and the beginning of the 18th century, it becomes part of this Baroque mentality, this Baroque mentality of grandois schemes, of, of beauty, of beautification, of, 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 of exhilarated uh, feelings of, of greatness and grandeur with, I don't know, with, with the art that we were presented with, the music, the literature, the architecture, they were all speaking one, one language. And, 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 and with them, uh, you, you have these tables that are prepared in such complex ways. Sugar, I said it was a medicine, but sugar also was, was very good in, in, in sculptures. Uh, so, so you have tables that are decorated with these fantastic uh, sculptures, I, you know, sugar sculptures. And I think the most interesting one is the, the, the story of, uh, I can't think of the, 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 the Swedish, this is a Swedish queen, I think it's Carolina, um, who was invited by the Pope. And, and you know, the Pope gave this, this banquet in honor of Carolina, uh, queen, of, queen of Sweden. And, um, and among other things, he had he had four artists working on these beautiful uh, sugar sculptures. The problem was that when the when the when the banquet was over, of course the the queen receded to her quarters and the pope receded to his quarters. But before the pope went to sleep, he ordered his 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 servant, his chambermaid, to go down into the kitchen and tell the and tell the servants to actually uh, store the sugar in, in, in the right manner. Um, but to his surprise, the sugar sculptures were all gone. Um, what, what's, what, what has left, what we have left to this very day are the, the images, the four beautiful images of allegories inspired by uh, Greek classical mythology. Um, and I think that's what was also left for the Pope to look at. Um, the reason being is that show, you know, sugar was very expensive. Sugar was as, as expensive as gold. And so I, I, I think I know what the servants did with it. You know, some of them might have tasted some of it, but the rest of it probably they have, they have hidden and eventually sold on the market because sugar was something that... that, that um, was 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 very expensive, um, including the knights have bought large quantities of sugar in preparation to the great siege of fifteen sixty five. Since we mentioned the great siege earlier on, and was that for medicinal reasons as well? Or yes, sir. Great. Oh, yes, sir. Large quantities of vinegar, large quantities of eggs, because uh, the white and and the yellow of the eggs was used for different bruises, different cuts, different burns. Okay. Um, of course, eggs can, among other things, they can, especially if you have cuts, uh, they will help the blood to coagulate faster and to stop mm -hmm. bleeding as quickly as possible. Um, but then, of course, also uh, quantities of 
quantities of sugar, um, apart from also quantities of wine. Um, what does the sugar for exactly? Uh, medicine, I mean. Well, see, sugar, like, I mean, it, it, you know, the taste on the tongue and all of that, it has this brain effect of, you know, we know what happens to kids, right, when you feed them a lot of sugar. Right, they start bouncing off the wall. So, so it it was among other things. It 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 had these effects on the psyche, which are still pretty much the same effects that we have today. The the difference is that sugar was not clarified and clean as we know it today. Sugar used to be um, primarily imported from Sicily, um, although if, eventually at a later date, uh, thanks again to the expansionist policies of the British Empire into the Caribbean, but also the French Empire, but primarily the, 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 the British expansionist policy into the Caribbean, where uh, the sugar cane plantations would be, would be developed and uh, the Brits would start to import large quantities of sugar into Britain and the rest of Europe, making it possible for uh, for, 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 the, for the product to become increasingly democratized. So, um, you know, sugar was also used, Carl, by the Brits as, you know, they've dropped the price of it and they used to feed it a lot to the workers working in coal mines during the 19th century. Of course, so, because it's a high, uh, it's high, high level of, exactly, high level of, of glucose would, would, would actually make it possible for, for all these people to, to actually perform for longer periods of time. Um, down under where, you know, in the pits, in the coal pits, they're, they're mining coal for, you know, the, for the uh, industrialized nation of the world. Um, incidentally, at the same time, Malta is part of the, is part of the empire. Um, and eventually by the end of the, I'm sorry, by the first two decades of the 20th century, we have uh, comments by the Brits saying, that the Maltese uh, consume four times the amount of sugar than their, 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 you know, their, the, the Brit, the, the British people in, in the UK. So um, one wonders why Malta also suffers from a high level of diabetes among other oh, food related diseases. So um, there's a, there's a, there's a whole history behind it, right? Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, Lisa saying honey is also a topical antibiotic. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, Lisa, honey is very, very interesting um, for, for many reasons. Um, without any doubts, the medicinal aspect is, is, is of particular importance. And we have also treatises in different parts of Europe being written, especially uh, the Greeks were very fond uh, of honey. There were you know, um, fantastic experts there. But the most important science, uh, scientific treatises that we have about about honey that, that even date back to the early medieval period uh, come from places like um, Egypt, for instance, right? Um, uh, honey, uh, especially in North Africa, honey is a staple product um, in sweets, for instance. Uh, so, so you know, people in Italy, primarily Sicily, people in Spain. Uh, people in Malta, we all think that we have our own sweets. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most, well, unfortunately, fortunately, depends how you want to look at it. But anything that involves honey, anything that involves almonds and peanuts, uh, those were the specialities of the North African coast and the Middle East. Uh, pistachios, um, very, very expensive, right? Um, Malta, I mean, the, the, the myth says... Uh, the housewife t tale says that even the word Malta is melita, which which means honey. Um, we have we have since dealing with Malta to a certain extent. Um, two Arab uh, travelers also wrote about uh, one in the ninth century, another one in the twelfth century. Uh, Al Himyari in the in the ninth century and Ibn Khaldun. Uh, writing in, in the 12th century, uh, talk about the abundance of honey that one could find in Malta. Um, and apparently people used to stop, uh, ships used to stop and actually collect uh, honey, among other things like goats and, 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 and mules and, and, and donkeys, um, which were like uh, apparently relatively abundant. Well, maybe today we get them in different forms, but um, well, you know what I mean. Uh, 
it, it, it actually what's really interesting uh, in the case of Malta, we're talking about an island where most of the food gets to be imported. Uh, well, today we're, we're almost 85% of all the products that we consume in Malta are actually imported. Uh, but the same period that we're talking about here, the, in other words, the middle and the late medieval period, and, and more so in the early modern period, um, the case of Malta is interesting because all foreign products were considered to be of a better quality. And therefore, even that, even, even though that might not necessarily be the case, okay, but the understanding was that they, you know, foreign products, foreign important products uh, used to, one had to pay more money to acquire them from the market. The only exception was honey. Uh, Maltese honey was prized to the, to the point that the, it, it, it used to be more expensive on the market than any um, imported product. And uh, it seems like that we did not, I mean, in the case of Malta, the use of honey was so abundant that we did not have enough to, to meet the local demand. So there was also like grain and other products, there was also uh, a, a demand for uh, the importation of, of, of honey. Um, All right. So yeah, um, honey was also another product, Lisa, that was, that was also used to be stored uh, because uh, in cases of, of wars, but also in, in cases of accidents or so any hospital, would would also store large quantities of of honey. Um, unfortunately, well, this is another area that still uh, requires, especially in the case of Malta, we're still waiting for people to to do research on because uh, some of the information that we have is is a bit skewed, especially since the, the hospital was also an institution of the Knights of Saint John. Uh, and normally the hospital, apart from grain, it was the second most, well, I'm sorry, let me put it this way. Apart from the Navy, the, the, the hospital was the second most important institution uh, with the second largest budget uh, within the, within the um, expenses of the Knights of St. John. And um, if, if you were to look at some of the documents they have, for instance, uh, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of money used to go into buying food products for sure, because you know patients had to had to be fed. But if you look at the exorbitant number of, for instance, uh, eggs and 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 honey and sugar uh, and and wine, um, in in many cases, this, this, these are not simply being bought for, for just for the consumption of. Uh, the patients, but uh, a number of them were, were actually used, an amount of, of these quantities were, was actually also used as, as part of the medicine um, or the healing or, 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 or hailed because of their healing properties in the case of, of the hospital. So yeah, honey also very important. Nice. Uh, do you mind if you, uh, we circle back to some of the uh, points we, uh, oh, you oh, mentioned there? Go ahead. Because... Uh, we had some questions, and uh, I think some of them were very close related to what you were uh, talking about. Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, one of the questions we had from Charlene was, uh, what were the main architect ar architectural features which were most prominent in a house with regards to food storage? Okay. So, uh, as, as I've already pointed out, um, without any doubts, uh, the kitchen normally was the largest space. In other words, the space where you would store liquids, the space where you would have potentially more than one table. Um, in other words, the, the main kitchen was the space where you would have uh, the heart, mm -hmm. so, so the fire, right? But also the, the same space where uh, you would have potentially more than one table, which are the workbenches where you would prepare your pasta, you would butcher your animal, you would fillet your fish. Uh, but in, in, in many cases, especially in, in aristocratic buildings, you would have more than, so you'd have an entire entourage. You'd have five, six, 10 people who work in the kitchen, okay? And so each person has a workspace where they would, or two people together would they have a workspace where they would, they would, um, 
pretty much finish the product. However, however, in the case of, for instance, butchering, you would have a room where you are, um, uh, you would be butchering cuts, right? And that doesn't happen in the kitchen. You would have a dedicated space for that. You would also have a dedicated space, for instance, for this big cauldron that you're running so that you would boil your chicken before you actually start to get rid of all the feathers, right? So, you know, that would be a process that one would do unless you want to plug the feathers before. Ideally, you don't do that. But normally what happens is you boil the, so that you soften the, the skin and then you, plug, and so it would be a lot easier to actually plug the feathers um, before you actually start to prepare uh, the the bird for for what whatever recipe you, you have in, in 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 mind. So there were these dedicated spaces where all of this would happen. So you'd have a storage space where to have the meat, uh, where the meat would be hanged, where the meat would be butchered, where the meat would be prepared before it actually gets to be introduced into into the main kitchen, right? Um, but but then you'd also have so in in the main kitchen you might have, for instance, the equipment to roast coffee beans. You would have the equipment normally uh, hung against the wall where you would, uh, so fixed against the wall, you would have the, 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 the coffee crusher. So, 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 so all of these, all of these elements, you'd have your set of, of, um, of knives, different types of knives, right? You would have all your sieves and all your pots and pans, right? Various, several of them. You probably would have, so I'm thinking right now what, what one would find in the, in the Inquisitor's Palace kitchen. You would have shapes to make ice cream, right? So can you imagine that? Um, you, you, would have, you would have literally shapes of fruits and designs so that you stuff the ice cream into it. So when you serve it, can you imagine? I know it, it doesn't last long, but this was the opulence of, of these people. So, so the space, as I said earlier on, the space itself, you might have three, four, five rooms that form, especially for the aristocracy, that form part of the kitchen complex. I think one of the best examples is Q in, 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 in England, where um, you, have, you have a beautiful kitchen set up. And from time to time, they actually have reenactments there. Um, and, and you would see them uh, you know, going through the entire process of having the entire kitchen happening. And they set fire to the stove. You know, they, they light the fire there. They, are, they pretend that they're preparing a soup. And so you have these massive cauldrons that are attached to the, to the swiveling arm, which, you know, you hook it up and then you swivel this whole piece of, of, of arm holding, holding your massive cauldron on, onto the fire and then uh, link to the fire also. So while the, while, while the pot is up on top and down below, you'd have the spit running. And so... Uh, why am I saying this? Because this is also a period when, so try to imagine this. If you have someone of particular aristocratic level coming to your place to eat with you, we're talking about, it's not like today. This is not like, you know, you have an entree, or, you know, a first, a second, and then a dessert. It doesn't work like that. You would have, I don't know, 23, uh, 30 dishes that are served interchangeably. And there isn't anything like, you know, uh, I don't know, ice cream for a dessert. It doesn't work like that. So for instance, sometimes you'd have meat first, right? Have with sauces, right? And then the next thing would be a sorbet. And then you might have, uh, I don't know, uh, a salad, right? And I know that in your head, you're saying it doesn't work like that. It should be never. No, it doesn't work like, you know, there isn't as yet this notion of having a, a first plate and you don't have bruschetta and then you know you might you might eat bruschetta in the 18th century we have references to bruschetta in the 18th century but you would eat it i don't know halfway through for instance um probably served with so many other sauces uh so you know a, a, again i mean you would have within the kitchen complex you would have one room uh, possibly a credenza which was in Maltese, we say, we say credenza in Maltese, okay? Um, the credenza had two purposes. Uh, so some credenzi were the cupboards where you would store all the silverware or else your fine china. Yes, china. So you would import. Uh, can you imagine that? All the way from China itself. Guys, this is, 
I mean, getting there today for us, it's very easy because you hop on a plane and in 10 hours, if you're in Malta, in 10 hours, you end up in China. No big deal, right? Um, but here we're, talking, here we're talking about a month and a half of traveling. If you're lucky enough, you don't, you're not hit by uh, bad weather or um, your ship uh, is damaged or you call into a port and you're attacked or you're... You're kidnapped by pirates, so it's 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 not as straightforward as one might might think. And we've tried so hard. We've tried to copy China, okay? Literally, uh, you know this this beautiful ceramic product that was imported from from China itself, where if you if you plant it against against the sun, you can actually see right through it. And and we have um, we have parts of Russia that that made the mess of attempt to try to replicate it. We have, we have France and we have Holland um, that tried to replicate it. Uh, we have Italy that tried to replicate it. No one ever got anywhere close to it. But having a China set at home was, was of course, again, another sign of opulence. So you might have a cupboard where you would specifically have your bohemian uh, decanters and your bohemian uh, set of glasses where you would serve different types of wines and different alcoholic drinks. Um, so again, I mean, I'm thinking about Malta again, but on Christmas Eve of 1798, the Grand Master would have on the table a printed, guys, a printed, okay? Not a manuscript, but a printed wine menu with nothing less than 23 different types of wines. Um, opulence at its best. So this might, this guy might, within the kitchen, he must have had a space where to store Takai from Northern Italy. Uh, you have, you know, wine coming from Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Hungary, um, Greece, and then on top of everything, a wine also coming from from the from the Dutch. From the Dutch colonies in South Africa, uh, so wine coming from South Africa, uh, just to put you into into perspective here. So Christmas Eve, seventeen ninety eight. I mean, w you know, this is a tiny little rock at the end of nowhere, right? It's not even seen on maps, and and you have this element of connectivity where the sea is not really a force of isolation, but it's actually a bridge to the rest of the world. Um, so so in the kitchen, you must have had architecturally, you had to have these spaces. So so you had one type of credenza where you would probably store under, under, you know, uh, under lock, right? So you know, probably the person that runs the, the 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 kitchen would have the key to your silver plates, your silver cutlery. Um, an interesting case in, in in the archives of the Inquisition here in Malta is this this gentleman who, uh, at one point in time, decides to steal one plate. And uh, from time to time, he used to silly, silly sod. He 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 hid the silver plate up in the in the in, in a staircase, in a very small staircase leading up to the rooftop of the Inquisitor's palace. And he used to cut bits and pieces from it and sells it in Valletta, right? So so they could make some money, right? Some extra money. Um, well, that didn't really go down very well with the, with the Inquisitor and uh, gave him a hard time. So, so again, uh, architecturally, you would have the space for that. But the credenza was also the cupboard where you would store cold foods. So if you prepare a salad, for instance, you would prepare a salad. And then once that you prepare it so that people don't mess about with it, you know, the kitchen entourage won't mess about with it, you would lock it up in the credenza. So normally... The credenziere, so the, the gentleman that, that holds the key to this cupboard, had would. So earlier on, I said you might have like fifteen servings, twenty servings, twenty-five servings, right? So what happens is you would take one uh, dish prepared, one one hot dish prepared in the kitchen, uh, out on the table. The people would consume that. Once that they consume it, you put that that dish away. And you bring something from the credenza, so some sort of a cold food. So let's say a salad, right? So you take the salad from the credenza and you put it on the table. While people are eating, the chef is warming up the next dish, right? So there is this, this force of rotation 
um, between between servings and 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 for someone you know for a for a sophisticated kitchen to operate like this, you definitely had to have the necessary space um, to to actually make this possible. Um, what's his name? Uh, Bartolomeo Scappi even informs us that within the Pope's kitchen, there was a space where they had uh, all the necessary tools for a mobile kitchen. So when the Pope traveled, he, the Pope also used to take his entourage with him, including Bartolomeo and his kitchen brigade. And so they had, they had all the, can you imagine, they had, they had these like sophisticated um, suitcases, if you want to call it. So these like massive wooden chests that used to fold them in, inside and they used to turn themselves into a, into a box. But once you open them up, they became like the workbench of, of Bartolomeo Scappi. Um, so it, it was, you know, we might think that these people were not sophisticated, but in actual fact, they were super sophisticated. Um, no, I mean, something like that sounds, uh, sounds amazing. It's like... Uh... You don't even see that in fiction. It's like a traveling uh, pop-up pop -up kitchen, and uh, and yes, let's, let's face it, uh, uh, a papal court isn't very small. That must uh, support a lot of people. So uh, it does sound amazing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's and and then the equipment itself. I mean, the the invention. Uh, the reason why I'm, I'm I know I, I'm firing like machine gun fire all over the place. No, no please go ahead. I've, I've, I've mentioned ahead. coffee. I've mentioned coffee, for instance. So for to make coffee. You needed to acquire the bean, obviously, but then the bean you had to roast, you had to crush, and then once that you pour, once that you pour um, water on the crushed uh, uh, powder, coffee powder, there was a tendency that you end up uh, having a lot of uh, sediment at the bottom of, at, at the very bottom of your of your of your cup. And so tr I need you to focus. I, I need you to focus. I'm sorry. I, what I need you to think of is. Uh, today, when we drink our coffee, uh, we end up with nothing in the in the in the cup. Everything disappears, right? This was not the case uh, until very recently. So the idea of instant coffee, or the coffee that we drink from our machines, I mean, it, it doesn't work like that. You know, um, you had to you had to handle a coffee cup um, quite gently because each each time that you each time that you you try to drink, um, there was a tendency of sediments. Uh, hanging in the in the in, in the liquid itself, and so you start having these this all these particles in between your teeth that that has this gritty effect, right? But in in, in Naples, they already in, in, you know the whole idea of the percolator uh, starts in the 17th century in what was known as uh, kukumi. They used to call them kukumi, right? And and, and the role of the kukuma was so that uh, you would filter, literally, you would prepare coffee, you would boil coffee. Um, without ending up with all the particles, or at least to reduce the amount of particles of sediment that that end up in your coffee. So there is there is this this drive towards innovation, which um, we think that these people were stagnant, they were backward, they were not inventive, they were they were fantastic at, at you know um, oh, definitely their their knowledge of how, for instance, the effect of the whites of eggs. Um, when mixed to make sweets, for instance, or to make bread, um, you know, when when you when you get rid of the yolk from uh, from 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 the egg, uh, you stand to increase the possibility of once you introduce the egg to produce, especially once mixed with with water and flour, to produce a lighter lighter bread. Um, and so we have the, the Spaniards were fantastic at this in what was known as pane de España which we today refer to sponge, right? So the, the British concept of the sponge is a light cake where you would, you would cut it in half and you spread jam on it or marmalade or whatever, chocolate, right? Um, it's, the Spaniards actually introduced this and it was normally prepared in small buns because you know, getting, getting, rid of, getting rid of the yolk, you have to have money in your pocket of course. To, 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 to actually be able to, to invest this money in, in preparing in preparing all of this stuff. So here we are talking about very sophisticated individuals who, um, so 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 you have the development of the of you know the French development or uh, haute cuisine in the in the 17th century, particularly with you know 
Louis XIV, I mean, Louis XIV. I mean, the sophistication is just out there. You have what was known as Sosa Landes, which, which, which basically, uh, uh, well, uh, an alternative version of Sosa Landes, where instead of instead of using eggs, you would use oranges. Um, so the, it, it becomes it becomes Sosa Maltes um, because uh, the blood orange, the famous blood orange, the French would actually, especially the the sisters of Louis the Fourteenth, would even have fields gardens orange gardens here in malta really? um yeah 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 uh malta was a major exporter of oranges and then all the way until uh, the 20th century the queen until very recently used to receive regularly every year a box of uh, maltese oranges um particularly the the blood orange um so uh, the sauce maltese the sauce maltese uh, which was uh, again at, at, uh, an invention of the French. Um, the Maltese have nothing to do with it except for except for the for the orange, right? Um, the sauce Maltese was was again this, this this experimentation of taste. So here we're having you know some of the greatest chefs um, writing some of the greatest recipe books that we can think of. I mean Menon, for instance, is one of them that that come to mind. Um, who who wrote I don't know how many versions of the same recipe book, um, and whose whose recipes eventually were, were were copied by so many other people who aspired to equal the the creativity and the innovation of Menon himself, um, you know, which eventually of course led uh, later on to Karem, for instance, another great of, of of the kitchen. So 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 you had so so you had you know this this fantastic. Um, exposition of ideas and exchanges that transcended beyond boundaries beyond borders well you know food gets to be copied gets to be shared gets to be adapted um and it doesn't need a passport it, uh, you know it transcended Absolutely. religions it transcended religions i mean it defied religions even though even though we're talking about you know three of the leading religions in the world that that have among other things dictated in some cases, what we eat and when we eat things. Um, so, if, if you know, if I take Islam for instance, you know, um, alcohol, particularly wine, um, is not something that 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 a Muslim is encouraged to to consume. But at, at, at the same time, pork, for instance, is not something that the Muslim is 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 allowed to, to to consume. So, even by just looking at what one consumes, I mean, we have we have shops, for instance, that do not open. On Fridays, mm -hmm. um, like butcher shops, for instance, don't open on Fridays in Christian spaces. We have we have beautiful studies in a in, in a book by Flandrin and Montanari um, that talks about uh, about the rhythms also of not just what one consumes, but also of what one finds on sale on particular days of the week. Because let's let's take Christianity. You cannot eat you cannot eat meat. Or uh, any uh, a derivative of of um, milk, so milk and 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 cheese um, you cannot consume, right? Uh, you cannot consume eggs um, or every Wednesday, every Friday, every Saturday, uh, throughout Advent, throughout Lent, and on the eve of the four main feasts of the church. So technically speaking. For the poor people, these were pretty much the products that they consumed every every day. So getting rid of that meant that you ended up having to just eat bread every day. But for the opulent, the situation was slightly different because you could explore different you know different products and make those different products available uh, in in a way that that others that others couldn't. Um, it was just you know, a change of menu rather than a uh, than restriction. It was a forced change of menu to a certain extent, but but at the end of the day, those that had money in their pocket could actually navigate very easily around around the restriction, right? So, um, but there again, yeah, I mean, going back to your question, Carl, uh, you know, opulence was also reflected in the size of the size of the kitchen and the amount of equipment that one finds within the kitchen itself. Okay, uh, since you mentioned uh, religious restrictions on uh, on food, we have a question by Laura. Uh, I read that after the Reconquest, the spot checks were done on religious converts to see if their meals really did conform 
to their new way of life or not. Are there many records on how frequently this happened or what the consequences were? Uh, Laura, I, I, you know, a very pertinent question. Um, at the time of the Inquisition, it was not necessarily um, doing spot checks that was really the, the issue, but it was actually the people in the street that would, that would report others for the consumption of products that were, they were not meant to be consumed on specific days. So um, we, we have, we have so, in the case of Malta, but this is not just Malta, anywhere where you would find the Inquisition, you are going to come across ample evidence to indicate how people reported each other for, or denounce, they literally would denounce. Well, you have, you have two sides to it. In some cases, people denounced others. So they would appear in front of the Inquisitor and they would say, listen, I've just seen Carl eating um, meat fried in eggs, right? Boom, there you go. Carl is going to be probably uh, inspected, right? Um, watched over. Well, if we have, if, if not, it's not just me who's showing up, but there's like three, four people saying the same thing, they would definitely arrest Carl and they will, you know, they will not necessarily punish Carl, but they would, they would, they would have a good word with Carl and they would say, listen, don't do it again, right? Um, of course, those that, that would abuse from the system, um, they would eventually get some sort of a punishment, right? Uh, so, so, you have, so you have people that were um, denounced, but then you also have self-accusations. Just to give you some ideas, for instance, um, a group of individuals who normally would self-accuse are uh, sailors. If you're caught on a ship and you run out of bread or ship tack, right, um, biscuits, right, um, if, if you don't have any food to eat and you have meat left, uh, what you do is you eat meat. We have, like in the case of Malta, we have, we have several, well, several, that's an exaggeration. We do have examples. We have situations of, of uh, sailors that would uh, call into the harbor and um, when they land, they would together go to the Inquisitor and uh, one after the other would go in and they would say, um, kindly forgive me, Father, because... Uh, we were caught without any food uh, on the ship. We were dying out of hunger. The only food available was meat, and so we had to consume. We had to consume that meat. So, uh, going in as a group and, and self denouncing themselves, the inquisitor always looked favorably to these kind of to these kind of mindsets. But we have we have so many instances um, of of evil people abusing from from the consumption of. They couldn't care less. Um, like one particular case was a priest who was so hungry he just he, you know he just found whatever he had in his cupboard and and prepared this you know this omelet with with uh, multi sausage in it and you know and as soon as soon as he heard that uh, people were talking from the kitchen window he he could hear that people were talking about the smells wafting out of his kitchen uh, he threw everything away and then he went out to show the the people in the street that he was he threw everything away because he knew that he was going to be reported right so double trouble for the gentleman trouble number one he had products that he had to throw away um trouble number two he could have easily ended up in the inquisitor's palace um and and being arraigned in court for uh, not following uh, days of when to uh, consume when to fast or when to feast right Mm -hmm. But we have examples of this sort coming from Mexico, for instance. Um, very, very beautiful uh, examples coming from Mexico. Uh, for those interested, you can read the works of Ruth Bahar, um, which are which are quite quite intriguing. And since I've mentioned Ruth Bahar, uh, I happened to meet Ruth a couple of a couple of years ago, four or five years ago. Um, we are very much interested, both Ruth and myself, we have been doing some comparative studies together about food and love magic um, and how food was also introduced into this, into this world of, 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 of magic itself, of, of controlling through the ingestion um, people whom you've, you're having problems with or people that you love. So there is the um, sortileggio ad amorum, um, Latin term basically meaning love magic, right? Um, so you, you would cook up food. I mean, 
when we prepare food, we prepare food because we love people, right? We want to share our food with those people, right? But in this case, these are uh, normally women, more than men, but or even men would, would resort to this. Women that want to be loved or want to be respected or want to tame their violent husbands, for instance, that would, that would uh, adopt, uh, they would take a product and they will uh, prepare it uh, in a way into, into a filter, into, into a magical potion, and then they will feed it to, to, their, to their male counter, counterpart or female counterpart in the case of men, of course, uh, with the intention of either to be loved or uh, not to sleep with other women um, or uh, for in the case of men, for a girl to, to notice this gentleman or to love this gentleman, right? So, so you have, you know, some of them are quite funny actually to read through, um, but it, it also talks about the claustrophobic um, spaces that these people existed in. So uh, going back, going back to, to Laura's question, um, without any doubts, there used to be inspections, especially among, uh, among shopkeepers, for instance, um, because shopkeepers, like for instance, in taverns, it was a regular, there, there used to be regular, let me take the case of Malta, because I'm more informed about Malta, because I can, I, can, I can definitely vouch for documents that we have, which indicate the regular um, surprise inspections that um, the local authorities used to carry out in particular shops, um, especially, especially the market in the capital city. Um, so, you know, apart, apart from various aspects of the inspection, they used to inspect weights, uh, they used to inspect the quality of product, but they also used to inspect what is being sold, right? And, and for those who are not, who, who, who are not following the, the rhythms said by the church of, of fasting and feasting, um, then of course they used to get themselves into trouble. But more importantly, you didn't really have to wait for the, what were known as the akatapani, uh, you know, the, the, the market police, okay? Mm -hmm. Instead of waiting for the market police, you would, you know, people felt compelled that, now I know this sounds like, uh, you know, everyone is just telling on each other, right? Um, there was a little bit of that, but there was also, there was the other side to it of, you know, share it with me and I will not say anything. <laughs> so there's this, this patron client relationship of Omerta uh, verging on the mafia mindset. Okay. So, well, it's not mafia, but you know what I mean, right? Yeah. It's the uh, same principle. <laughs> uh, so right now Cross is saying, uh, I'm so hungry. I'm not going until this three months, but I am so eating right after this. Yeah, well, this talk of food is uh, really uh, <laughs> stimulating. That's good to know. And regarding uh, the love magic, uh, Dungeon Matron says, hence the old adage, uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Well, uh, strangely enough, that's not right. Um, because uh, it's also through his groin, okay? So... <laughs> <laughs> so Fair <yeah. laughs> Um but yes, you're right. I mean, we have we have instances where guys Valentine's Day. You think about Valentine's Day. We have a beautiful image here in Malta. At the actually, to be precise, it's found in the uh, refectory that the Jesuits built in the um, uh, second half of the 18th century. So we're, again, we're talking about Baroque opulence here. But this entire refectory is painted with it's the best. So you can imagine someone like myself who's intrigued by food. All, so the, the, the hall is really big. Uh, it's maybe 20 meters by eight, 10 meters width. So it's, 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 it's sizable, right? For a small place like Malta. If you don't know where Malta is, go and look it up. It's microscope. You probably won't find it um, on the map. Um, but the Jesuits who are here with, with, you know, with a very important mission, among other things, these are the most learned of themselves and the Dominicans, among other things, are the, are the most learned um, theologians within the within the within the entourage of the church, uh, the Dominicans, of course, you have the Inquisition. All the inquisitors were coming from the Dominican order, Dominicanis. If you look at the emblem of the Dominicans, you would see that it, it, the emblem, the coat of arms, has a dog that is carrying a, a, a lit torch 
in, in the mouth, Domine Canis. These are the watchdogs of orthodoxy, right? On the other side, you have the Jesuits who were the learned, I mean, these were the, these were the intellectuals par excellence of the Tridentine church. Um, so so the, the Jesuits would build, would build a seminary to train um, anyone in Malta who was aspiring to, to join the order of the Jesuits. Um, and, and this building itself today, it's the, it's the Archbishop's Coria. It's found in a place called Floriana, uh, but the refectory uh, has, has these, these four walls that are inspired by, primarily inspired by, uh, image, um, by uh, passages from the Old Testament with the exception of one side, which is inspired by the arrival of St. Paul here in Malta. Um, of course, St. Paul being the being attributed as the apostle that that would start Christianity in Malta. But what's what's really interesting in within this hall, where you have uh, it's prob it's painted by a gentleman, a Sicilian gentleman who goes by the surname of Leonetti. Apparently, the entire space was finished by 1762. Um, he must have spent some time here in Malta, uh, studying. Um, the, what is being consumed here in Malta. Uh, we, have, we have some of the most important foods that we still associate ourselves with here in Malta um, painted there. But what's really, really cool is this heart-shaped biscuit covered in chocolate. So yes, you're right. It's probably, you know, a Valentine celebration of, uh, you know, using food to attract the attention of, of someone else but what's really interesting is it's in a heart shape and it's covered in it's covered in chocolate so it, it, you know there must have been an element of interest in there but what's also interesting is that we also find um you know some of my you know most well some of my research is based on the criminal proceedings of the archives of the inquisition here in malta um i have primarily focused on the period uh, 1650, 1700, and 1750, uh, 1800. Those were the periods that I focused on. And we come across some instances of uh, mainly males trying to lure uh, women by giving them food as, as a gift. And this is not just normal food. Like, is that they're not like frying meat or, yeah, uh, roasting beef or anything like that. But it's, it's normally something... Uh, more elaborate, something a little bit more sophisticated, something more petite, um, something that that yeah, you know, something by the way, it's like a box of chocolates, right? It's 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 a way of how to get to a lady's heart, also. So it's not just it's just not men, but it's also. But you also have to understand this. Uh, I have this beautiful quote also coming from the Inquisition archives, where where this gentleman um, apparently was giving his wife a hard time. And uh, among other things, uh, she would report him to the inquisitor because he was eating meat on prohibited days. So try to imagine this, your wife would report you, right? Uh, for, eating, for eating meat on prohibited days. But what's really interesting, she says to the inquisitor um, that he said to her, it doesn't really matter what goes into the mouth. What really matters is what comes out of the mouth. So uh, <laughs> it's like, yeah, she's... <laughs> But she, she, the reason why she, she is also appearing at the Inquisitor's Palace is because women as gatekeepers of food, at least at that point in time, could have ended up being the ones who have committed sin. Because if you prepare, if you prepare prohibited food for your, for your family members, if you're preparing food uh, for family members on fasting days, right, particular foods like meat and eggs and cheese and milk, then of course you're you're committing sin yourself. So um, so this lady wanted to set her record straight, and among other things, she would even report her husband, um, which apparently couldn't care less about the inquisition. So there you go. Um, it, it so again, it's not just he said it's not just what goes into the mouth that matters, but what actually comes out of it, right? So um, yeah, whatever whatever that might mean at the end of the day. Okay, uh, mostly we've talked about uh, kind of uh, semi-private uh, dining, like the House of the Aristocrats and uh, so on, but 
I have a question from Sherlyn here. Uh, apart from coffee shops and wine shops, was there anything equivalent to a restaurant? And if so, could everyone go there? Because uh, we know that, for example, some things like uh, wine shops were mostly a male uh, domain kind of thing. So, Carl, well, Charlene, uh, well, thanks for the question. Definitely, uh, we have uh, taverns, okay, where people could go e eat and, and drink, and also osteria. So it's like a hotel. But normally, Osteria were also places where some where people were given the license. So when you're applying for a license to operate a tavern or else to oper to operate a, a hostel, uh, normally the license would also include in it, depending on what your request is. But you could always request um, that uh, you get you get permission to prepare food, right? As Carl said. This is primarily a male domain. So you have people that would do tavern hopping um, from one tavern to another, especially in places like the, you know, in, in cities where you would have several of them where, well, in the case of Malta, um, you'd had several, several taverns in the city area. And we know of males that would go from one tavern to another to have a drink um, and from time to time to also eat. Um, the reason why I'm mentioning cities is because cities, in, well, several cities in Europe, I'm thinking Paris and I'm thinking Madrid and Barcelona and Marseille, I'm thinking uh, London, I'm thinking uh, Rome and Naples and Palermo and Catania, uh, you know, Athens, Constantinople. Uh, these cities were, were cosmopolitan in their nature. So you have a lot of foreigners who are visiting. And so these foreigners would need places where to sleep but also they would need uh, services to, to feed themselves. Um, so, uh, so yeah, you, 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 had, you had that situation where, um, yeah, pe people, people had to be provided with the necessary, with the necessary service. So taverns and, 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 and hostels provided kind of support apart from many street food services, like the donut yeah. seller. Yeah, yeah. Donut seller, the tripe seller, the cheesecake seller. Uh, these were all found, the water seller. These were all found in the streets. And so uh, on the way, while you're trotting around from a place to another, you would come across these individuals who would provide you with a service. Yeah, it's, it's kind of street food is not the kind of thing I associate with uh, the 17th or 16th century. It's, it, it oh, sounds... Uh, yeah. Carl, tr truckloads of it, truckloads of it. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Also, uh, since you mentioned uh, earlier, you're going to jump on something completely different uh, regarding the uh, genocide with the uh, coffee and so on. Uh, since Malta was well known for its uh, corsairing activities around the Mediterranean, were there any foods that entered uh, that first entered Europe through Malta that we know of? Uh, so on. Uh, I don't think so, Carl. Um, well, definitely not that I know of, right? Um, uh, I think it's, it's more the other way around. I think it's, it's the, the element of connectivity. I, this is the other thing. I mean, people often ask me, so do you think Malta is the source that mm, I, I, I'm not sure about that? I don't think so. I think it would be a total exaggeration. What's really interesting about Malta is that unlike, the, especially in coffee, the, unlike the rest of Europe where coffee was very aristocratic in its nature, in Malta, it was drunk by the slaves and it was drunk by the common people in the streets. The, you know, in Europe, you have sophisticated coffee shops where only a handful of rich people could go and have a drink of coffee. In Malta, the first coffee shops were actually slaves' prisons. Mm -hmm. So technically speaking, coffee did not have the elitist aristocratic background that one would find in the rest of Europe. So when, when in Europe, only a handful of people were drinking coffee, in Malta, people were drinking coffee galore. It actually became the immediate... Sub What's really cool is that here you're talking about a society that consumed large quantities of wine. So we went from a depressant into a stimulant, right? So um, I think that that's what makes it really interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, Malta, I mean, let's think a little bit about Valletta. Valletta is, is, is half a kilometer squared in area, half a kilometer squared. You can walk lengthwise, for those who are not familiar with the, with the island, you can walk lengthwise from the main city gate to the length to the entire length of the peninsula in maybe 20 minutes. So we're not talking about a big place, but 25 coffee shops, licensed coffee shops in 1784. That's sort of uh, coffee. 
that's a lot of coffee. And then, and then you, have, you have visitors like Tjevenant, for instance, who this f- famous Danish uh, artist who, who stops twice in Malta. And, and you know, he talks about the quantity of, of and the availability of coffee. And he loves coming to Malta simply because, and he will buy bags of coffee to take back home with him. He says, it's so difficult to find, to find coffee back home, but why it is so common here in Malta? So it, it just blew his mind that on this tiny little rock at the end of nowhere, you know, the, this is the periphery of the periphery. This is the frontier of Christianity, right? Um, so the frontier, the periphery, what I call the periphery of the periphery, right? So just to put you into perspective, how, how isolated and how, yeah, um, how separate from the rest of, of connectivity, from the greatness of Europe, of Paris, of Rome. Yeah, um, you know, these are the great cities of Venice and Genoa and Pisa. I mean, this is at the end of nowhere. Uh, and, and yet this guy is just flabbergasted. And he's saying, before I leave, I always make it a point. This is listed in his diary. You know, he's, he's meeting this monk and he's, you know, when he goes to him, he says, well, you know, the, the monk asks him, a very good friend of his, asks him what he would like to have. And on Christmas Eve, again, Christ, or it was Christmas, it was Christmas Day. On Christmas Day, he said, I would love to have coffee. So there, there's this earning to drink this drink of the sophisticated people in the, in the rest of Europe. And here, it's, everyone was just drinking coffee. Um, but no one was drinking tea which was the sophisticated drink in, 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 in Denmark and in Holland and in Belgium. Yeah, this, is what, this is what the rich people were drinking. Kind of surprised me when you mentioned that because uh, I know that in some, uh, some places here, uh, you know, the uh, tea in a glass with milk is kind of a pretty much a traditional thing. Is that something that came later with the British? Uh, no, not really. In fact, what happens is that even this is also a very interesting, this is a very good point that you've put forward. Uh, we see that the Maltese by the 18th century are already introducing uh, milk into their, into their coffee, um, among other things, because this, the, the, you know, they, have, they are driven by this whole notion of, of sweetness, right? Um, there is a very strong sense, there's this love for sweets um, among the Maltese. I mean, the confectionery shops, again, pretty much like coffee shops. Valletta was inundated with confectionery shops. So there's this love for sweets. There's this love for, you know, there's the sweet tooth, tooth kind of thing. And, and incidentally, most of the confectioners were not Maltese. They were all French or Italian right. uh, or Greek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the Greeks, the French and the Italians. The Greeks uh, just ab- above Citygate, very different from what we know it today, just above Citygate, you know, some of the best uh, ice cream makers were actually Greek. So, so the Greeks were renowned for preparing um, some of the best ice creams that one could find on the island. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's it's yeah, it's it's very interesting. It's quite it's quite intriguing, quite intriguing. Yeah, definitely. And another point I remember from your talk on uh, coffee a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken is uh, how people started to uh, mix uh, chicory into the uh, into the coffee to make it last longer to stretch it out which is not something that uh, would be done if it's like a very high class drink if it's but if it's everyone drinking you can see that happening so so the the idea of also roasting and crushing chicory with with coffee beans is to increase your coffee uh, quantity uh, so you're trying to to, to produce coffee. So this is poor quality coffee, even though the Maltese think that this was, you know, because it's a tradition, it's one of the best things in sliced bread. Uh, and technically speaking, this was, this was, you know, people who couldn't afford to actually buy uh, enough coffee for them to, to actually drink straight coffee. They, they, had to, they had to mix it with something else, which was um, the very nature also of, of bread. We used to consume large quantities of brown bread. I mean, We've spent years and years and years, entire centuries of aspiring to, to eat white bread. And, and then we figured out that brown bread is healthier. What, uh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And, and so we've reversed, you know, this is how, that's why it's so difficult to, your first question was, if someone had to travel back or someone had to travel to today, will they, well, they would probably, they would probably think that we're going bananas because today, we're well to start with we're, we're eating well we're trying to eat more brown bread because we believe it's healthier we're also paying more money to buy to to pay uh, to buy brown bread so that would definitely you know um 
that would definitely mess them up big time if they were to travel to our time. Um, and th so two things, A, it's expensive. So to them, that was the cheapest bread to buy. B, um, why are you eating brown bread? If you have the money, you should be, you should be eating white bread. So these people have dreamt to eat white bread. Um, and here we go again, you know, we, we flipped, right? Um, so people say, don't drink wine. Uh, and then science is saying to us, so, you know, some wine every day in, 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 responsible, in responsible amounts is, is good for the heart. So who to believe here, right? Um, hey, I'm, I still drink wine, right? So um, no matter what the science is saying, yeah, it's, it's, there's nothing better than food to, uh, to keep a sane mind. Amen okay? to that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, we've almost been going for uh, two hours here. Oops. Uh, it's okay. Uh, it's been a fascinating, fascinating listening to you. Uh, but uh, maybe it's time to ask you one last question before uh, before sure. we let, let you uh, let you go. So, is there any particular misconception about historical food that you commonly encounter in the media, whether that's TV, movies, books, video games, or uh, what have you? Uh, I think I think the two hours that we've spent together was primarily a drive in trying to um, help us understand, in some cases, the misconceptions that we have about some products. Um, I would say maybe Malta more than other countries. Uh, in the case of Malta, the research in relation to food is relatively quite recent. Um, so... Uh, there are a lot of misconceptions on on what constituted historic food. Um, you know, I always talk about one one fun thing I did with Heritage Malta maybe two years ago. Uh, I spoke about rabbit. For those who are who are coming from outside the island, uh, rabbit is is definitely um, and oh, thank you. I think that would really help. <laughs> My son just just put the lights on. I just keep on going. Um, now they're laughing at me. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, what I what I did was basically I asked them what they considered to be, what they considered to be, you know, uh, whether they consider rabbit to be a national dish, and they all agreed to it. Um, in Maltese, we call it francata. But then the next question I've asked them was. Um, if, if you were to come across a tourist, how would you say, how would you ask them to, to prepare fancata? And we've ended up with four different variants of fancata. Um, and then, of course, they've asked me, you know, what is the historical background to it? And I said, they said well, they wanted a recipe because uh, everyone asks for a recipe. It's as if the recipe would, 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 would establish very clearly um, what people were eating at the end, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. It doesn't work like that, right? Um, and I said, I, I said, you know, the earliest reference that I have is rabbit meat prepared in a pie. So will that become now our fancata? Um, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't work like this, right? So pe people often ask me what is the oldest recipe. And when I explain to them that, that there isn't one recipe that represents an entire nation, um, because we all have, we all cook somehow or some way. Or else we see others that cook for us, but you know, it's food does not always end up tasting the same because of, of various reasons. It could be a change, a small change in the recipe. It could be a, a, the cooking technique. Uh, it could be the addition or the less so of any particular products. Um, so, uh, so that's one side to it. The other side to it is that we should not feel compelled to eat like what people used to eat in the past. Um, there is this, there is this like, in this globalized world, we feel that we are, we constantly are being, we're constantly being asked to identify who we are. Um, and, and food is one way of, of, of identity. Um, but, but this is the other thing. I mean, we are, we are being constantly told you know, what, what is your food? How does your food denote your identity? So if I say, if I say pizza, you immediately think, you immediately think Italy, but we all know that Italy has endless amounts of foods, which, which denote Italian cultural identity, right? Definitely. If I say frog, frog legs, you might think France, but uh, we know that the French have an endless, yeah. If, if I had to say fish and chips, you might think 
England, right? Uh, but by the way, the national dish has been proclaimed two years ago, uh, and the national dish for the UK is chicken tikka masala. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, I did a study with my students some 16, 17 years ago, uh, basically on campus at university, and I, I sent them out and I said, guys, do me a favor, uh, go out to people, students, and ask them in less than 10 seconds, I tell you the five, the five products they think denote Maltese identity. And they said it's rabbit. Um, the second one was uh, the second and the third were two two types of soups that we find here in Malta. One is called minestra, Italian name, caulata, Italian name, right? Uh, I did the same exercise just before COVID um, in in 2019, so what 15 years later, and um, so same environment, same question. We're dealing with students who are educated who are well-traveled, right? Uh, and the answers were twisties, which is the snack, um, ring number one. Ring number two is our cheesecakes, which is again, this fast food snack that we find in Malta. And the third thing was chisk, which is, which is a lager that is also found. So within, with, within less than a generation, within less than a generation, there has been this mind shift of what constitutes um, Maltese food among, among the younger generation. Now, the evidence is indicating very clearly that there's this shift. Should we say to these people that they're wrong and the people of 15 years ago were right? Uh, that is not the case. Uh, that's why I said cultures change, you know, mentalities shift. Um, so I think it would be silly on our part to, to actually think that uh, food and food cultures don't, don't change through time. What's happening today is that maybe they are changing a lot faster than, than change has happened ever before. So uh, while in the period that we've talked about, 15th, 16th, 17th, 18th century, 19th century, there was change, but change happened very slowly. Uh, today, uh, the velocity of change has, has increased to a point that I believe that uh, it, we're, we're finding it very difficult to identify who we are also through our food. And so there has been this growing interest in, in people like what I do. So I have a job for now, right? People asking me, can you go back and, and identify what's, what's historic food here in Malta? But it's, it's historic food. It's nice, it's nice to rediscover these foods. It's nice to learn about these foods, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to go back and consume those foods, especially when you know some of the stuff that we prepare for for taste history. It it can be mind blowing, like you know throwing throwing large quantities of sugar in tomato sauce. Um, people just go, oh no, I don't, I don't think so, right? Um, but if, if you want if you want to eat the way they used to eat back then, then you have to be prepared for that taste, right? And we have people that eventually would would have like two bites and then they give up because it is an acquired taste. You might not necessarily like it. So um, yeah, but there we go. Okay, that, that was something. I'm still surprised that no one mentioned the uh, loaf of bread in either of those uh, two studies. Yeah, well, um, the thing is that, uh, so as we speak, I am pretty much the only one who is constantly working on food and research about food here in Malta. Um, we have people that dabbled into it. Uh, the problem with food is, unlike other areas of research, there isn't anything like F for food in documents. And then normally you have, to, so I, I, I base most of my research on criminal proceedings. So basically what happens is you have people that are being reported for God knows what, the murder or stealing something and food is only mentioned in a secondary manner so there isn't anything like an entire collection of so when i talk about the manuscript the 1748 manuscript that is an isolated manuscript that's, that's just one um so you know if people are thinking of yeah it's that there's truckloads of stuff available out there and all you have to do is just sit and and, and, and write about it it's not the case you know all all of this you know the stuff that i've been talking about is the result of 30 years of research in archives by which uh, the information is primarily secondary. Um, it's piecing up these fragments of, of information that eventually help us understand better the past. But um, well, I enjoy, 
I enjoy doing it. I have been doing it since 1998. Um, so, so yeah, here I am talking to you guys about food and 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 how food changed through time. That's a hell of an investigation. It is. Palpatelia <laughs> uh, uh, isn't at least a bit of sugar obligatory for tomato sauce. But just yes, you're right. Bit, yeah. Yes, yes, you're right. Um, so tomato is very interesting. I was saying to call before we, 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 we talked about this today, um, before we, we joined online with you guys. Um, tomatoes were fruits like, like oranges and peaches and, and, and strawberries. So um, the introduction of uh, tomatoes with pasta, so adding a color to, to pasta, is only, it, it only starts in Italy in the mid 19th century. So for all of those who thought that that you know pasta that sauce with pasta existed for a very long time, that is not the case. Tomatoes were fruits. Okay, so you would find them in a fruit bowl. Um, with if you look at paintings, you you will find that um, with, with you know in, introduced with with, with with fruit. So it was called consumed fresh, like apples and oranges, right? Um, however, yes, you're right. You need to put some. I would love to share with you one of Menon's <laughs> recipes where there's like there's like some some I think 80 80 grams of sugar into it. Um, I don't think that who would be able to to consume that large quantity of, of sugar in in it actually kills. The idea was that, 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 that there was this constant concern that pretty much because of the nightshade family, uh, the the understanding was that since the the leaf was poisonous, then of course the fruit was poisonous too. Well, of course that was not the case. Um, but but there again, um, there is also that sense of opulence by putting a lot of sugar in your in your sauce. Um, it's another way of how to say in Maltese we say menandul um, bzar hai Basically, it means that if you if 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 you have pepper, then you can sprinkle it. Why? Because pepper was very expensive. So um, as Carl said, if, if, if you can't afford straight coffee, then you add chicory to it. Um, the saying in Maltese is just the total opposite. In another sense, if you have, if you have pepper, then, you know, then, then spread it as, as much as you can, uh, which means that you are, that you're, that you're rich. So um, adding, adding large quantities of sugar, your sauce was basically another statement to, to show how how not necessarily sophisticated you are uh, in the sense of taste but definitely how opulent you, you, you were and how deep your pockets were that you could afford to spend so much money in pouring so much sugar in in your sauce so it might not necessarily have been the result of taste um, but rather uh, another expression of of economic power Okay, so it might have tasted strange, but it sure got the point across. I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, uh, Doctor, thank you again. Uh, thank you so uh, very much for this. This was uh, absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invite. That was a pleasure, and I hope we'll uh, have you over again at some point in the future. Most certainly, anytime. <laughs> thank you. And yeah. thanks, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day and uh, see you next week. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.